My guest tonight is a sports legend. His dashing style and courage cast a spell over Indian cricket in the 60s and 70s. To many, he remained an enigma, the sense of mystery heightened by his royal background. Even today, with his looks and style, he continues to be an icon of the elegant man. I am delighted to have a rendezvous with an old friend, known to the world as Tiger, the Nawab of Khatoti. Mansoor, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much for coming. No, no, I, we should have been here much earlier, Simi, but uh, my wife is a busy girl, and we couldn't organize our program together. I should apologize. Knowing that you're media shy these days, somewhat, Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm doubly happy that you've accepted my invitation. Thank you. Question number one, why are you media shy these days? No, I think I've done my bit over the years. I've written for 20 years, I've done the commentary, I've played the game. The game has changed a lot also, and uh, mm. I'm not quite as conversant with it as I used to be. So I think it's time that younger people also took over and gave their views. So I've kept away a little bit, especially from this World Cup. This is it. I mean, in the World Cup, every single cricketer who's ever <laughs> carried a bat yes. came out to, into the media circus, but yes. you didn't. No, I didn't, but I've kept away, in fact, for the last few years. I said my piece on Azhar many years ago. Mm. I've not been en enamored with his captaincy, unfortunately. And I didn't feel like repeating it again and again. So uh, there was nothing new to say. I've always called you Mansoor. Yes. But the world seems to know you as Tiger. How, how did this name come about? I don't think it's got anything to do with cricket to me. I think my parents gave it to me because I probably rushed around a bit too much when I was young. Why, in fact, it was given, I really don't know. And I don't deserve it, I don't think. <laughs> come on, you're being modest now. No, not modest at all. Tiger is the reason be ferocious. You were never ferocious? No, of course not. No, I was a very quiet, gentle child. As a child? Yes. You grew up pretty ferocious. <laughs> I don't think so, no. At least on the cricket field. Well, not ferocious. We, were, we tried to be pretty competitive, yes. Mansu, you've always been described as someone who's quite naturally a gentleman, a prince. Have you received privileges because of your royal background? Um, well, it doesn't necessarily follow that a prince should be a gentleman, you see. Um, okay. I know a few princes who are not gentlemen <laughs> at all. Okay. And I know a lot of gentlemen who are not princes. Um, I think, yes, uh, certainly in the beginning, let's say in the 40s and 50s, um, we had a pretty privileged life. But that all changed uh, from the 60s onwards. And all of us had to adjust to a different system. So did you receive any special courtesies? No, not at school or anywhere. On the cricket field? No, not at all. It was, it was very competitive. Mansoor, mm -hmm. what about the time when the umpires addressed you as your highness? No, no, that's, that's a made-up story. I mean, the guy was LBW. Yes. Uh, he was out, but the umpire never said your highness. The umpire said he's out. You bowled to Colin Cowdery. Yes. And you struck him. On the pads. On the pads. Yes, and a field. And you said, how's that? Very loudly. And the umpire said, it's out, Your Highness. No, he did not. He said, that's out. He forgot the Your Highness. <laughs> but oh, no, no, that, that's not true. But it makes a good story, of course. But the story did the rounds for years. Well, one doesn't deny these stories. They're good fun. It's all a part of, part of the game. But you were given an Eastern Playboy Prince tag when you were in Oxford. How did that come about? That was a courtesy of a gentleman called David Green who was playing the team, and I remember we were playing a match, and I was batting, and this fellow came to interview me. Mm. David pretended to be a great friend of mine, and he gave him all the background of what I was supposed to be. And uh, he made me out to be an Eastern play playboy, or a playboy of the Eastern world, and which is uh, not fair, because uh, none of us had enough money to, be, to, be, to become playboys in those days. 
we still don't actually some of us <laughs> and uh, that was a little unfair but the, again the story is stuck but you couldn't live it down for a long time a lot of people helped me <laughs> your family motto is uh, it's, it's a it's a muslim motto nasrumin allah fatihum kareeb which means the uh, help of god in a quick victory it applies in a lot of situations did your ancestors have cricket in mind no the only person who played cricket uh, uh, was my father okay your father was in Douglas Jardine's 1932 team to Australia the famous body line attack mm. did he ever talk to you about any of his experiences well he died when I was very young uh, but my mother told me quite a little bit about it and she said that he was that he wasn't very happy with Jardine as a captain and especially with the new tactics that mm. Jardine uh, interpreted and uh, he refused to stand close to the wicket on the leg side mm. the body line and then Jardine said well if that's the way you feel, I don't need you here. So he came back halfway through the tour. He came back to India. He left that. Well, we got 100 in his first test. Your father captained India in 1946. That's right, yeah. Did cricket come naturally to you, Mansoor? Cricket was always there. I mean, if, if even the servants played cricket. Even the cook played cricket. And my father's bearer used to play cricket. So we all used to play cricket together. Did you play cricket with your father? I remember playing one or two matches there with him. But I was very small, about nine or ten. It was quite an important match, and I was fielding, and the fellow hit the ball quite high up in the air, and I got underneath it, and then suddenly my father appeared over me and caught the ball over my head and said, this catch is too important for you <laughs> yet. And uh, th that memory stuck with me for, for a long time. But at what age did you decide to take cricket really seriously? Yeah, I played my first first-class match for Sussex at the age of 16, when I was still in school, and th then I realized that... Uh, if all things went well, then this is what I was going to do for the next 20 years. And that's when you had that accident? Then I had the accident in 1st of July 1961, while you were playing in the Oxford University team, hmm. you had a car accident. That's right, right. Can you tell me about it? Yes, uh, we were playing in Brighton, and a number of us went out for a Chinese dinner in the evening. There, we there was only one person who had a car, he had a Morris Minor or something. And Abbasidi Beg was there with me. Um, hmm. These guys decided to walk back to the hotel. I said I'd keep the driver company, and uh, in those days, the double dual carriageway had just started in Brighton. And uh, if I remember I, correctly, I think the car came in on the wrong side, a big car, and he went straight into it, and I went through the windscreen. Nobody was actually very badly hurt, but a splinter went into my right eye, and I lost eyesight uh, of the right eye, oh, almost 95%. You were 20 years old? I was 20 years old, yes. What were your thoughts? Well, moment. nothing to begin with, because I, I, I couldn't tell. I was a bit dazed in hospital. But it, it took about two or three weeks to realize uh, that you'd lost an eye. Did you think you may never play again? Yes, I did think so, but I said, let me give it a try. And so I went back to the net um, and practiced very hard. But again, I mean, I think I lost my efficiency by at least 30 to 40 percent, if not more. So was it hard adjusting your vision? But it's very difficult because you can't judge distances with one eye. You can't tell how far an object is. I, I, I don't drive at all now because, especially at night, I don't know how far the headlight is in, in, when it's coming towards you. Hmm. So it was, it wasn't, it was difficult uh, batting if the bowler was either very quick or if he was a slow bowler and tossed the ball up in the air because you couldn't judge where Spin. it was going to. Well, where you couldn't judge where it was going to fall. Hmm. So it became, that became very difficult. You didn't have the depth of vision. Also, I couldn't feel close to the wicket. 
But we, uh, I mean, I wanted to play cricket, so I played at, at below par, that's all. And I probably didn't enjoy it as much as I was enjoying it hmm. before, before the accident took place. You tried wearing lenses, didn't you? I tried to wear a contact lens. I played a match uh, when I came back to India, um, but I was seeing two balls coming at me. With the lens? With the lens, yes. And about, they were about this far apart. And uh, I had to pick the inner ball, because that was the correct ball. And that wasn't very easy. But then at tea time, I threw it away. I threw the contact lens away. I said, uh, I'd rather close one, eye, which I used to do with the, with, the, with the cap. Put it over the right eye. Tilt it down. Tilt it down to cover the right eye. People thought it was the style. You know, the, the, it wasn't. It was purely just to cover the right eye, because you used to start running with water and so on. What about colors? No, colors are fine. I can play snooker. <laughs> yes, you beat me at it too. I can. I reckon I can still beat you at that. Yes. <laughs> Sonny Garbuskar said much later that it was only when he had to wear a patch over his eyes for a few days that he realized against what odds you had played and played so well. Yes, but a lot of people don't realize this uh, unless you happen to be an eye doctor and you you realize what it means not getting that depth of vision. But Mansoor, it must have been a great triumph of will. Because six months after the accident, you played your first test match hmm. in Delhi? Yes, that's right, yes. Well, it, I think people in India didn't realize the, the, the extent of the accident. That's what I wanted to ask you. Yes. Were they aware of this handicap? No, they were aware something had happened, but they didn't realize that I had actually lost an eye. And uh, I scored some runs uh, in that series. Uh, I got 100 uh, in Madras and got 70 odd in Calcutta or something. And uh, people said, well, fine, this guy's OK. Let him play for India. Did they ever question you? Yes, they did question me, but that was three or four years later. I remember I didn't get runs in a, in a two or three matches. So this uh, selector came and said, we think you better have a checkup with your, on your eye. So I said, that it's a bit late now. I mean, I've been playing for your mm. country and my country for four or five years now. So this, he said, OK, we'll we leave it. That's it. <laughs> yes, that's it. It used to be like that in the old days. <laughs> really? It wasn't very professional. You just have to tell them and they listen. Well, they, they were kind enough to listen. <laughs> I think this is, again, the royal privilege, I don't perhaps. think so at all. <laughs> Far from it. When you took over from Nari Contractor, you were the youngest captain ever. 21 years? Two months? 18 days? Is that right? Well, I don't remember exactly, but I was 21-something, uh, yes. And has anybody broken this record? Not yet, no. Not even Sachin, no? No, I don't think so. How did, how, how did it all happen? Well, uh, I was never meant to take over as captain. Mm. I was the vice captain, and the, Nari was doing well. But then he had this ball hit him very badly on the head. Griffith's ball. Griffith hit him, yes, whose action some people consider somewhat suspicious. Bowled a short delivery, and Nari ducked, hit him on the head, and uh, he ended up with having two emergency brain operations in, 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 in West Indies. It was a very frightening incident because the... Uh, um, there was blood on the ground, on, on the wicket, and we had to cover it with sawdust. And then go into bat, and you, we weren't sure whether to look at the bowler or to look at the blood. It, it, was, it was frightening. And then Mr. Manjaker hmm. got hit, hit on the nose, which nobody knows about. He lost his eyesight for about two or three hours, and, and the rest of us weren't really interested in playing cricket at that time. But then we had to, um, but uh, that's how I became captain, and then I stuck around, um, I'm not sure how, for the next almost eight, nine, ten years. And Nari never played again? He played for West Zone against South Zone. But we were terrified uh, because he had a steel plate uh, in his head. And uh, it was quite clear, although he came to me and said, listen, uh, why aren't you fellows bowling bouncers at me? So I told him, I said, Nari, if mm -hmm. we hit you, I mean, who's going to be responsible? Mm -hmm. I, and I said, it's not worth it. Uh, but he was very keen. He was, he was mm -hmm. terribly keen on cricket. And he said, it doesn't matter, I don't mind. Mm. So we said, no, we won't do it. We're friends. We can't do it to you. And uh, he didn't play against India. No. no. Can you describe to me how different the cricket scene was when you were captain? Um, well, the game, is, uh, the game has changed a lot. I mean, when I started, we weren't staying in five-star hotels. Uh, certainly, there was no television. Uh, there was all um, uh, commentary, radio commentary, most of the time. Television came in a little later in black and white. And mm. obviously, we weren't exposed to that extent. Nor did we make that kind of money. I think uh, the last match I played, we got 2,000 rupees for the test match. For the whole test match, it was 400 rupees a day. And I started playing when I think we were getting paid 250 rupees a test match. 
now, of course, uh, it goes into a lot of money. Mm. We won't even tax on our money because the, the income tax for the disabled is not worth taxing you. <laughs> but you treated it like a sport. Do you think the sport has gone out of the game now? No, I don't think so. I think if you, you take a look at the Zimbabwe team. Uh, they beat India, and they're the best sport. And three of them walked without looking at the umpire when they were out. Yeah. Uh, as long as you are true to yourself. I mean, I, I know players who will not walk. They say we will not walk. It's not our job. It's the umpire's job. Then they shouldn't complain when the umpire gives them out if, he, if they're not out. Because it, mm. it will happen. But isn't it strange, Mansu, that people even now remember and call you as one of their favorite players? I mean, I have guests on my show who've said that. Many years have passed, but they still remember this as a very glamorous era. It's lived in their minds. I think memory is very selective for me. They remember the good part. You see, the Indian public uh, uh, is very good in that sense. Uh, they will remember, uh, for instance, Azuruddin is getting with a stick nowadays. He has for the last two, three years. But once he retires and he's, and he's settled elsewhere for two, three years, they'll remember his good parts and they'll forget the bad parts. Th th that way the public is, is, is pretty fair in this country. But you were captain during one of the most glamorous eras of Indian cricket. Tell me, what, what were the magical moments for you? I think the time that India won for the first time abroad was against uh, New Zealand in 68. Uh, and I was captain, and I think we all enjoyed that uh, particular moment more than anything else that we enjoyed, at least in my career, was beating for the first time a team outside India, which had never happened before. And what were the fun times? Well, there were lots of fun times. I remember playing a match in Gwalior once, and we had to go through some very thick forest. And on the way back, um, Mother of India and I organized the dacoits to capture uh, Mr. Vishwanath. And he was stopped by the dacoits, and they got hold of... No, it was Prasanna. They got hold of Prasanna, and they pretended to shoot him. And he stuck his hand on his heart and blood came. I don't know how you film people do it. We did all that and uh, Chandra Shekhar and uh, Vishwanath took it very seriously and they started crying. They <laughs> said, Hi Prasanna Margya. <laughs> Hi Prasanna Margya. <laughs> that was, uh, it became very serious at the end. And uh, we had to calm them down. We had to get a doctor, give them injections and this and that and the other. And uh, we started laughing about it. A week later, nobody could afford to laugh in front of them for a week because we thought they'd, they'd kill us. But uh, we've done all kinds of funny, funny things. I remember once in Guyana, uh, somebody caught an alligator and this Rachik was and it was dead and it was lying there. And, and our host said, what should I do? I said, give it to me. So I put it in somebody's bed <gasps> at night. And this fellow came back about 4 o'clock in the morning. And we were trying to keep awake all night. We couldn't. And he didn't even notice it. Don't be silly. <laughs> he went to he put his head on the pillow and he went to sleep. And, and the alligator's in the and bed. The alligator was in the bed, it was dead of course. And it stayed in the bed till he woke up in the morning and he got up and then he suddenly realized that, that he'd been sleeping with an alligator, something which he's not, not exactly been used to. But <laughs> we've had a fun times and a good time. Also. Who who was the cricketer you did this? I don't want to mention his name. He's still very much around. <laughs> we used to enjoy ourselves, yes. Yes, certainly. Mansu, when for you did the did the motivation end? I think it finished uh, around about the early 70s. Why? Well, I'd done it for 10 years, and uh, I was, didn't seem particularly keen. On, I didn't want to travel a lot, and uh, I wanted to settle down. I'd got married by then. I'd had, I'd had success. So I, th I think I felt, and also my reaction was slowed down by then. And one felt it was time to get on to something else. 
But tell me, is there a nostalgia for those days? Do you ever have a yearning when you're watching the TV? Oh, God, I'd like to do it one more time. No. Really, I, I, I've never felt that I've, that when I've seen somebody uh, getting a bit of adulation on the field or doing well on the field, performing well, that I wish I was there. No, I haven't. I've, uh, I've felt it. I've had my time. I've enjoyed myself. I've received a certain amount mm. of adulation and goodwill from the people of India. Mm. I've also received a lot of criticism. I've had a share of both. But I think the time is gone. Once it goes, uh, one should step on to other things. You also dabbled in politics for a while. Yes, I did. Uh, uh, I stood for elections uh, uh, about 10 years ago. Rajiv Gandhi was there. Mm. I wasn't very keen, actually. I had said no to one or two of the senior Congress leaders. Uh, but I couldn't say no to Rajiv Gandhi. Hmm. I didn't do too badly. I got over two lakh votes, but I lost. And then, then of course, uh, we lost Rajiv. So hmm. I lost my interest hmm. in politics also. Because I, I really, I mean, I admired him. I, 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 I liked the man. Mansur, you've said that you made it a point never to betray emotion on the field nor in public life. Hmm. Why? I, I did say that. Why? I think uh, at that time I felt that it, it perhaps was a sign of weakness and it would, would give the public a bit of a bit of a lever to get at you if, mm. if, if you showed emotion if they were critical if you showed emotion or if you showed emotion with the press when they were critical or when they wrote well about you if, if you were particularly happy but I must say that this was when I was 20 years old and I have changed a little bit and uh, I think it's important to show your emotion I think you know if, if, you, if you have uh, uh, children and so on and uh, I think you should display enough emotion for them to know at least that you love them. <laughs> How do you handle anger? I don't. I, I never get angry. Never get angry. Really? Yeah. I I, I keep thinking that it, uh, that just is never somebody else's fault. It's always my fault. So how can I get angry? Seth had said that he was always intimidated by you. Although I, as a, as a father, uh, I would prefer if he said he respected me more. Than, than, if he, than if I scared him more. Um, when he comes on, you better make him say it. <laughs> but he said there was always an air of reserve and formality in your relationship. I think I'm a, a reserved person, yes, in many ways. I, I don't, uh, uh, I'm not very gregarious in that sense, or I, I, I'm not a social sort of party animal or anything. I prefer to stay at home. So in, in that sense, he, he is right. I, I'm, I'm a, a bit of a private person. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm not that bad. <laughs> I've come all this way to be to, to meet you. <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying people said that. Your okay. son said it. All right. Well, not we make sure he, he takes it back. <laughs> <laughs> I shall do that because everybody feels that you do, that you have worn a mask really? for many years, and I would imagine Rinku is perhaps the only one who's really whipped it away. Well, she's been she's she's been close to me for many years now. She, I think she should know yes. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to ask, ask her. her yes. I'm waiting to ask her. <laughs>